Hello everyone, this is our science teacher Tim Martin, and in this video I want to discuss some of the basic properties of stars. As we go out on a dark clear night, such as this night that I photographed in the mountains of southern Utah, we can see all kinds of detail of stars. Remember, the only thing we ever get from stars is their star light, so we learn about stars by carefully analyzing this light. What can we learn about stars? We can determine their brightness or luminosity, size, mass, motion, composition, temperature, and distance. I'll save distance for another video, but let's go ahead and dig in, starting by talking about the brightness of a star. Here we can see a simple experiment with two light bulbs. Clearly, the one on the left is considerably brighter. We talk about apparent magnitude. This is how bright a star, or in this case, a light will appear. On the other hand, that may not be a true representation. This is why we also need to discuss absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude is the actual brightness of the star. We can see here the electric light on the right is a 25 watt light bulb, which gives off far more light than the 4 watt. In the previous image, the 25 watt light bulb was just much further away. With stars, we talk about the actual or true brightness with absolute magnitude. That's as if the star was 10 parsecs or 32 light years away. There's a well-known set of images that have circulated social media about comparing size of stars. Here we see Jupiter and Wolf 359, one of the smaller known stars. Beside that is our Sun, followed by the star Sirius. In this next set of images, we start with Sirius and gradually move up to the giant red star Aldebaran. Now, let's go from Aldebaran up through Rigel, Antares, and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is an extremely large red supergiant star. Finally, we go from Betelgeuse to Canis Majoris, one of the largest known stars. We can see a tremendous variation in the size of stars. Stars may be as small as the size of a planet, or over a billion kilometers across, more than a thousand times the size of the sun. We also talk about how heavy stars are. It turns out, we can't weigh a star directly by putting it on a balance, but we can watch their motion. The mass of a star is going to be proportional to how much it moves, and so when we see stars orbiting each other, we may be able to calculate their mass. It turns out some stars are as small as 1 50th the mass of our sun. Other stars may be over 50 times heavier than the sun. Let's talk about stellar motion. Here we can see a time exposure I took in my backyard. With a camera pointing north, I left the shutter of the camera open for several hours, and you can see the trails of stars as they have moved around the North Star. Is this showing actual star motion? Rather, it's showing the rotation of planet Earth around our axis. The North Star, or Polaris, is the bright one that's nearly directly over the Earth's axis. So, stellar motion needs to be separated out into apparent motion and actual motion. Apparent motion is motion due to the Earth's rotation, or it can also be due to the Earth's movement around the Sun. This is why we see different stars in the summer and in the winter. But stars actually undergo motion. So what are some common actual motions of stars? Stars may rotate as they spin about their axis. Stars may also as we just discussed, orbit another star, or they may also orbit other objects in space. Finally, there are some stars that are moving towards the Earth or away from the Earth. So there are several different actual, or sometimes referred to as proper motions of stars, as opposed to the apparent motion caused by our moving perspective. Star composition. We've never been able to sample a star, but we do know something about stellar composition by analyzing star light. We do this by studying the spectrum of stars. As we've discussed in class earlier, there's the continuous spectrum, the emission spectrum, and the absorption spectrum. The absorption spectra is the most useful one for studying stars, as this allows us to study the chemicals of gas in stellar atmospheres. Here in the lowermost black and white image, we can see the spectrum of a typical sun-like star. We also know information about stars by studying their temperature. This is a subject I'm particularly interested in with my art. 
As some of you may know, I'm a ceramic artist, and I enjoy spending time firing kilns. This is a picture of me stoking wood into the wood kiln in our school. Understanding kiln temperature can be done by looking at color temperature. With fire, the first noticeable color is a glowing dark red. It gradually proceeds up through oranges and yellows, eventually becoming white hot when we reach temperatures around 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other hand, welding using high current electricity to bind metal together may reach temperatures of 3 to 20,000 degrees. Another thing we're all familiar with is the bluish purple white color of lightning. Lightning may have temperatures between 15 and 60,000 degrees. As we think about star color, we need to understand the relationship between color and temperature. There are some stars, classified as M stars, that are more red. Most of the light they give off is in the red and infrared part of the spectrum. Other stars appear more white. That means most of the light is given off across the visible spectrum. So we see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple, but maybe the maximum color is in the yellow-green range. Finally, the O stars, the maximum colors they give off are in the blue range. They may also be giving off considerable amounts of ultraviolet. So the star classification system is one that has been developed over the years, where blue stars have hotter surface temperatures, roughly around 30,000 Kelvin. On the other hand, the cooler stars, the red stars, or M-type stars, may have surface temperatures around 3,000 Kelvin. Keep in mind, our sun is a G-type star. I'd like to encourage you to watch a very interesting video put together by the European Space Agency and the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute. What they've done is taken this image of the central region of the star cluster Omega Centauri. They've grouped out the stars by color and brightness, and we see this very unique pattern. This is explained quite nicely in a video that I will link in the comments below. When we graph out star magnitude, or their brightness, and plot it against the color, or the spectral classification, which of course is related to temperature, we see this graph that's known as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Henri Russell and N.R. Hertzsprung, they discovered this pattern in the life cycle of stars. Stars spend most of their time undergoing nuclear fusion along the main sequence. Then they may migrate over into the, the giant or the supergiant branch, end up their existence as white dwarfs down in the lower left. In the next video, we'll take a look at how we study starlight to understand the distance to stars. Thanks for watching and hope to see you again soon.